perform miracles on a daily basis. And uh, Eric was the, the leader of that group uh, for the last seven and a half years. Just an extraordinary electrical engineer, someone who was just an incredibly kind-hearted person who um, worked so hard on a daily basis to help anybody that uh, came to that place, and anyone who he ran across as well. And so um, the format of this memorial will be that um, uh, we have two other people who would like to, to make some comments. Um, and then I know there are others in the, in the group who, too, who would like to come forward. So anyone in the group who has had interactions with Eric, and I'm sure there are many, who want to come forward and, and uh, tell some stories and the, all the positive things that Eric did for us. This is a time for us to help his family heal, but also a time to help all of us remember Eric and, and all of the spectacular things that he did. Um, I think um, Jerry would like to speak next. Thanks, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Jerry Ryman. I'm the uh, director of operations um, here in the department of chemistry and biochemistry. And Brenda, I'm trying to record this on my cell phone. I'm not sure how good the quality will be, but I'm trying. Uh, we are still in incredibly saddened and um, shocked. You can still not hear me in the back. How about this? I'll probably just hold the microphone in front of my mouth and then that way you can hear me in the back. So we are still incredibly saddened and shocked about the sudden loss. Eric has been with us for quite a few years. Um, he started working for chemistry and biochemistry in um, September of uh, 2010. And he uh, has been running the electronic shop ever since then. I um, looked at his uh, resume today and um, brought it with me just to kind of give you an idea of what he did uh, before he came here. He worked as a design engineer uh, for the medical center in the Davis Heart and Lung Institute between um, uh, 2003 and 2010 and it was mostly fixing EPRs, working on um, high frequency um, receivers, pre-amplifiers, system tuning, system repair, system design, pretty much uh, the same things that uh, he later did for us. Before that, he worked um, for North Star Technologies, which is a division of Lakeshore Cryotronics, and before that for Schlumberger Technologies in, in Westerville. He also worked um, at Fort Rucker in Alabama as a field engineer for a while in the late 80s. And among other things, and I didn't realize that, I had forgotten that, he um, upgraded and serviced uh, Apache helicopter flight simulators uh, while at Fort Rucker. So that's pretty amazing. Um, among some of the other pieces of equipment that he worked on at that time were various Perkin Elmer uh, computer systems and digital equipment, PDPs, that many of us still remember from the old days. He was also trained um, in military specification 1460 soldering, whatever that is. Um, I think I know how to solder. I didn't realize there was a, a military specification for soldering. Well, that's quite remarkable. I have um, a recommendation letter here from somebody from the Davis Heart and Lung Institute, and uh, among many other paragraphs uh, praising Eric's accomplishment, this gentleman wrote that Eric is a very hardworking self-starter who invariably understands exactly what the project is all about from the outset, and how to get it done in the most efficient way. Eric is a resourceful, creative, and solution-oriented person who usually comes up with new and innovative approaches for the project. Hey, usually? 
always, Eric always came up with ingenious designs. There was nothing that he couldn't repair or fix. I'll give you a few examples of that later, but um, uh, he was just incredible in, in his, you know, quiet, laid back, um, very effective uh, approach. Um, there wasn't anything he could fix, at least nothing that I ever saw. Eric had um, an interest in um, resonant power supplies. And um, he and I talked about that quite a bit um, after I took over um, his supervision. Initially, when um, Eric joined in 2010, he reported to Tanya Whitmer for several years. Um, and then we uh, did some minor restructuring with Tanya, focusing more on the research operation than Eric uh, reported uh, to me. Uh, so I got to know him a little bit better. Um, and I went to the electronic shop more often than I, I did before then. So one of the uh, challenges is that, um, while well, Eric didn't have an office, he was in the shop. For those of you who know the electronic shop, it's a wide open area, and uh, there is no way uh, to knock, there's no door. So I didn't want to startle him, and um, I usually, as I made my way in, uh, the only place where I could knock was a file cabinet. That sounded maybe like that, but invariably it would startle him, which was exactly what I tried to prevent. So then I stopped knocking and I just showed up, but then, you know, you come right out from behind that file cabinet, startling him even more. So that didn't work. Eventually I would just say knock, knock, uh, but he would still, you know, be so immersed in what he was doing that invariably he would be startled. So we talked a lot about resonant power supplies, and um, he uh, really studied the theory behind them, and he wanted to improve them. So these are high energy density, very compact, small um, power supplies that have few losses. I downloaded um, a paper this morning from the IEEE website, and I tried reading this. Um, so the first page, you can probably not see this very well, but uh, the first page was kind of okay, so I made it to that. Um, the second page um, looks like this. There are partial differential <coughs> equations and um, some pretty wild uh, <coughs> matrices. So I sold out and got my second copy this morning. That was too much. But that's the stuff that Eric worked on, and he really enjoyed it a lot. So Eric has always been very laid back, very quiet and efficient. In fact, really quiet. I um, ran into Rosemary Loza this morning. She's one of our senior lecturers, and um, I think she knows where this is going. And she said to me, um, I'm really sad. You know, it's so tragic. Um, Eric passed. I can't believe it. Um, I actually didn't know him. I didn't know who he was until I realized that he and I sat in the uh, monthly managers' meetings for the last uh, three years. <laughs> That's how quiet and laid back Eric was. But very efficient. Um, we have um, a um, lunch room in Newman Wolfram on the first floor. And um, there's a refrigerator, there's a microwave, and I've told some of you that story already. Bear with me. Um, and a few years ago, the uh, microwave started um, sparking more and more. And eventually, somebody unplugged it and put a sign, big sign on it, do not use. Um, and um, I thought, OK, well, this is probably at least um, eight or 10 years old. We'll buy a new microwave. The next morning I come in, I see somebody's using the microwave and it's not sparking, so what's going on? I looked at it, it was not the new microwave, it was still the same old one, but it was working. So I had a suspicion and I walked into the electronic shop, um, startled Eric in the process again, and I said, um, Eric, do you know anything about that microwave? And he said, yeah, I, I fixed it. You know, I saw that it wasn't working. Somebody had unplugged it. So I, I just tinkered with it a bit. I played with it, and I fixed it. <laughs> so that's how he was. Uh, I can tell you that microwave is still working, and we are still using it. 
Um, some other time, um, I left my bike in the hallway because um, somebody was working in the network class of where I normally park my bike. I'm a biker like Eric. Bike to work pretty much every day. Although I would say Eric is more extreme <laughs> because he even biked in the winter when um, I stopped. But one day I left my bike out in the hallway and then an hour later I walked by and my bike is gone. I was all in panic. Who stole my bike? Um, then Eric fessed up saying, oh, well, um, I just you know, put it in the shop so that nobody would steal it. Um, and um, I also fixed your lights, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how Eric was. Um, dedicated to the job, serious, fun-loving, low-key, hard-working. He was an incredible resource for this department. And we are missing him a lot. So Eric Jackson, his colleague, um, will speak a few words next. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, I know what you mean about sneaking up on him there in the little cubicle because I did the same thing and I got in the habit of kind of calling out to him as I was walking that way here so he would know I'm coming. He did the same thing to me too when he came around my corner so but uh, I'm Eric Jackson and I, I work in the electronic shop. I've worked with Eric for the last seven years and uh, when he first came here it was very obvious right away working with him. We worked on a lot of jobs together in the beginning when he was kind of getting a feel for the place that he was very knowledgeable and very experienced and that was an important thing to me and I guess everybody in the shop and to anybody who works there because we uh, typically quite frequently we don't have schematics and manuals for the equipment that we're asked to repair and so that we basically have to really know what we're doing and be able to look at that circuit board and figure out what's on there and what it's doing and then isolate the problem and troubleshoot it and, and be able to repair it. And Eric was very good at that. And that, that was a very, very welcome quality. Um, he was a really great guy to work with. He was a real team player. And uh, he was also really good whenever you were working on things, and, and, and vice versa too, when, when you're working on something and you're really stumped and you can't figure it out, you could go to Eric and say, hey, take a look at this, just you know, see what you see that I'm not seeing. And he could usually come up with something, did you check this or did you try that? And likewise, if he got stumped, he would come over and ask for help too. So. Um, uh, beyond that, he was a good supervisor. He was a good guy to work for, and he made a pleasant environment for all of us, I think. I think we all agree. Uh, no stress. He pretty much, everybody kind of knows what, what, what they're working on and what their job is, and he just let them do it. And he would offer help if he could see that you, were, that you needed it or if you asked him. And, and basically, he was just a good, decent person. He was a very good guy. And uh, I'm going to take a comment that I got from Larry Antel that there aren't any bad memories of Eric and working for him. And we're definitely going to miss him a lot. I think maybe John Sullivan was. Oh, uh, Nathan Blair was going to be here, but he, he had to leave because his babysitter canceled. Down. Well, I'm John Sullivan, and I've worked with uh, Eric about the same length of time Eric Jackson has. Um, and I, now I, I'm going to have to repeat some of the things that have already been said, but I'll do it in my own words. Uh, I, too, have walked down the aisle toward Eric's uh, corner and announced my approach before getting there. And... Uh, <laughs> 
he does the same with everybody else. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what I was going to say is that Eric uh, Kesselring is a knowledgeable, experienced, hands-on type of guy. He knew his business and he enjoyed it. He had contacts throughout uh, many corners of the university, including the hospital that he came from and also the agricultural uh, offices. I guess that's the food, agricultural, and uh, environmental college formally. But he had contacts at the, uh, in the engineering department, physics, and of course, chemistry. He was always busy. He had lots and lots of things to do. And uh, it was because of all of these contacts he had. They were calling him up or emailing him and he was discussing things and he had work to do that uh, I I'm not even sure what all of it was, but uh, he was very busy. But he was also helpful to others. Uh, he often shared constructive comments and uh, would, would discuss things with you at any, any moment you uh, brought up a subject. And I can recall working on a, uh, a piezo-ceramic uh, transducer that was supposed to generate a, uh, a water mist for chemistry uh, department experiments. And I built a, a prototype of this mister generator on my bench, and I turned it on, and nothing <laughs> happened. It just sat there. So I, I was scratching my head, and. Eric came walking by, as Eric often comes walking by, carrying boxes full of parts, and they were rattling in his arms, you know. But um, <clears throat> at this point, uh, he came by, and I, I flagged him down. And I said, uh, Eric, this thing is not working like I thought it would. And he looked at it, and he asked me what it was and what it was supposed to do. And we talked it over, and he thought to himself and then said to me, I think that ceramic transducer needs to be enclosed in some kind of a resonant housing, maybe a containment of some sort to make it confined to, to its job. And I thought that was a pretty clever observation and I worked in that direction and put the thing together as it should have been and, and it turned out to be a fine, it worked fine after I took his advice. So uh, it's just, it just shows typical Eric Kesselring <laughs> Uh, constructive advice that he can see something that when it's right in front of you, you don't see it yourself. <clears throat> so anyway, that, that Mr. Machine went out to the, the uh, chemistry department. We made, I think, three or four of the assemblies and chemists have used it. And as is usually the case when things do work, you never hear any more about it. It's the ones that don't work. <laughs> you hear over and over again. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, and Eric had a, a fine sense of humor, too. He, he always enjoyed a, a humorous comment, and he sure had plenty of his own to add. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, w what I do know is that Eric was a, uh, a real asset to the chemistry department, and that we are all better for having known him. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, bear with me as I try to read through this. Um, I'm not as good as extra, extra, I can't even say it, to just speak out loud, um, so I'm going to try to do this this way. Um, I'm the Director of Research Support Services, and um, I was um, part of the committee when Eric came to the department to do the search for him, and um, I sure was happy to, to have him apply for this position, because we were very fortunate to uh, be able to have him in our department for as long as we did. Um, and I've worked with him very closely over the several, several years. Um, so part of the, this is kind of formal, but here I go. 
part of the foundation of our department successes come from the behind the scenes, the behind the scenes staff, including our administrative um, staff, our senior scientists, as well as our technical staff. Um, a large portion of these folks, as I am also, are very passionate about playing their part in the STEM education that we have here, pushing society forward through science, but prefer a little bit more low-key position than maybe a faculty position. Um, and we work behind the scenes. In some ways, the electronic shop um, has had a farther reach of support across our department than any of us, actually. Um, almost all of us have some sort of gadget or gizmo that needs fixed. Um, and none of us would be as productive or as effective in our work or in our research without this group. Um, Eric Kesselring was one, a one-of-a-kind engineer and leader of this group who supported our department um, with his commitment to achieve, which means he fix anything. And he was very content with ample yet quiet appreciation given by his customers. It's a privilege yet simultaneously a tragedy that we have this gathering today to share our experiences with Eric as a colleague, as a friend. Um, I'd like to share a few things to help us remember Eric's contributions to our OSU community. When we hired Eric, it was immediately evident that he was the guy for the job. Not only was he perfectly qualified for this position with lots of experience with RF electronics and Apache helicopters, and I'd completely forgotten about that, um, but he just oozed with passion for fixing things. I can picture him as a little kid. Um, I have two boys, and I can just picture him as a kid just taking everything apart <laughs> and figuring out what in the world makes this thing work. I, I, he's just that kind of guy. Um, and that's just the core of his character. Um, just spend a few minutes in his space in the shop, and you can see not just test equipment, but all of his creations. There's stuff in there that he's made, just little fans, little, little things that he just makes his space more, more Eric's space. Um, Eric was a huge asset to all of us in the department as manager of the electronic shop and, our, and as our Mr. Fix-It. Um, he supported with the whole CISG group, the undergrad lab equipment, all the shared scientific instrumentation and research groups equipment. And early on, he even established a new relationship with the merged biochemistry department across campus that we merged with, as well as, as, as you've mentioned, you know, when, when someone's good at something and can fix things, that spreads across campus. Everybody knows that Eric can fix their stuff. <laughs> uh, so he was very busy. Um, the, the equipment he serviced through the years was as simple as a stir plate um, to recently building a bovine stomach simulator, so cow stomachs, um, to troubleshooting equipment worth millions of dollars. Um, when Eric started the position, he and I were asked to fill the shoes of Dale Carwick. Um, who was the RSS director at the time. And um, Eric became the CISG manager and I became the new RSS director. And we were both newbies to being supervisory in the supervisory role. And especially early on, we had many conversations um, how to transition into this management position. We quickly found that we had a common mission, um, mostly to support the students in this department by doing excellent work, by making things work, with an attempt to avoid the politics that sometimes has the potential to impede our mission. Um, so we talked a lot about that. Um, so based on his past experience on campus, he naturally ended up um, spending a lot of time in my lab. Um, and as a result of this and our supervisory roles, we worked closely together over the years. Um, when there was an electrical or mechanical type of problem in my facility, we spent several hours, days, over days, trying to fix a, a problem. Um, and in fact, sometimes it was just great to go talk to him, to say, hey, Eric, I have this really strange thing happening on my piece of equipment. Let's talk it through. And then suddenly, through his support, through his questions, there would be an epiphany. We would know exactly what was happening. It, it was just great times. I have two stories to share with you. Um, 
And the first, a lot of you have heard this, so I apologize for repeating this over and over. Um, and it's a story that I share, especially with students, um, to help them understand NMR a little bit more, nuclear magnetic resonance, um, and give them an everyday life experience with it. Um, and it's a great example to show, again, how Eric can fix things so quickly and see a problem and just, it's done. Um, so using a simple transistor radio, and um, he was able to find out a problem with filtering of RF on my system. So part of the NMR system, if you don't know, um, includes transmitting and receiving RF signals, which are radio frequencies. While one day when I was trying to acquire a solid state boron spectrum of a sample from Dr. Shore's lab, I found a large signal that I was not expecting. Um, called Eric, he popped down to the lab with this transistor radio, turned it on with the static going, and starts walking around my instrument. All around the instrument. Um, and it turns out that the, he hit a certain spot on the instrument, and suddenly it was like even bigger static noise. Um, it turns out that the instrument was actually receiving 96.3 FM, <laughs> um, which happens to be the same frequency of boron in my NMR. Um, it turned out that there was a hole in the filtering system of our preamplifier. It was a loose screw. And, and I share this story a lot, but it's, this is, this is Eric. You know, just taking some simple thing and making things work. Um, this example is quickly becoming very obsolete. Nobody hears static on their radios anymore or tunes to radio, but I'm still going there. <laughs> um, anyway, so my second story is um, really not one story. This happened over and over again, but the first time kind of took me back a little bit. So as you guys, if you know me at all, you know that I'm very protective of my, my equipment. I don't want people messing with my equipment. Jim knows this. Jim worked with me many years before Eric was here. Um, Jim Brooke, and um, you all know this. So one afternoon, and I don't remember what it was, um, one of the instruments had an electronic problem. So I sent an email or to, to Eric in the afternoon, it was late in the afternoon, and said, hey, Eric, let's come up with a time for us to meet and discuss the problem. You know, this is what I think it might be. This is the component that I think is wrong. Let's come up with a time to meet. And typically when we would meet, he would come with the lab and he would bring a toolkit and he would bring his oscilloscope and his multimeter and we would sit and discuss the problem and test things and look, look for signals. Um, and you should also know that our work hours in the morning did not match up. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's a morning person. I'm not quite as morning person as he was. So, so that afternoon, the instrument wasn't working. When I got in in the morning the next day, there was a student using that spectrometer. It was working. He had come in in the morning, diagnosed the problem, pulled the component out, figured out what was wrong with it, fixed it, put it back in the instrument. The instrument was working. And this was a big learning process for me. I learned to trust him that day. This was very early on when we first were meeting. I learned to trust him, and I also learned to delegate um, as, a, as a manager. And that was an important process for, for me. Um, so I very much appreciated that. Um, the thing about Eric, I'm almost done. The thing about Eric is that he was so humble, yet so confident to tackle a problem. When you first come to him with, came to him with the issue, he would say things like, I don't know, Tanya. I don't know what's wrong. I don't think I can figure this out. I, I'm not sure. Don't hold your breath that this is going to work. All these kind of things. It's very humble. And then in a couple of hours, it'd be, it'd be fixed. So he was just an incredible person. Um, he was a doer. No frills, no wasted time. He has this, this, this need, urge, to immediately solve any puzzle that we put in front of him. So he was an incredible resource. Those of us in the RSS so much appreciated his tremendous service to the department. 
and we thank his family for sharing with us. Um, Judy Gallucci, um, manager of our crystallog crystallography lab, has a few things that she'd like me to share. Uh, Judy says, Eric joined the electronics shop as its head after Dale Carvick retired. Those were hard shoes to fill, but Eric filled them well. The people in the electronics shop are a very important part of the department as they work on broken instruments, both in the teaching labs and in the research labs. On the research side, Eric spent many hours in the crystallography lab figuring out how to get various items working again. Sometimes these were mysterious problems, but Eric was tenacious and creative, and eventually the problem would be solved. His excellent work and his personal nature will be very much missed. To Brenda and your family. I extend my deepest sympathies for your loss. We will miss him. We will always remember him for his kindness and his willingness and drive to help, to help all of us and provide us with assistance. Uh, my name is Lu Tu Xu, and so, this one? Uh, yeah, my name is Lu Tu Xu. I uh, would like to re uh, I represent the uh, General Country uh, Prepare Region Lab uh, to thank uh, Eric for the great service. Uh, we serve the General Country Teaching Lab. Every semester, we have over 3,000 students. Uh, when the fall semester start, all the freshmen come to the lab. Uh, think about that, they can, f they try the very hard to work on the lab, but when you try too hard, they broke everything. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really the, the case. Uh, but we always have the peace of mind because we have the support from Eric's group. Uh, they can do everything to do the repair job, uh, fix the thing, rep uh, replace everything as, as quickly as possible, as efficient as possible, and the low cost. You never know without the cost. Uh, I have two examples. One is when any time when the balance broken because we have the a heavy usage in the lab. So, uh, but every time the the balance uh, broken, we contact the company, they said, oh, you have to replace, because we don't have the parts. Oh, that, that balance already out of the market. If you want to take a look, $900 for the, for the lookup. So then we contact Eric, then he tried everything. So he can use, he can buy the parts online or use some parts from old, a balance to replace and then make the balance back to work like new. And uh, another sample is one time we prepare the sample during the summer semester or summer break. We always prepare the whole uh, year's sample unknown uh, for, for the next uh, school year. But we made uh, about over 100 gallons of the sample. Then all the sample need to pump through the small bottle to keep. Suddenly the pump stopped working. Then we, because the pump is really old, maybe 15 years old or 20 years old, so now you can find the same pump. Now I, bring, I brought the pump to Eric and he uh, took a look then told me, uh, just replace the bed of the, with the drum motor. And then he just find the one piece of the bed from somewhere, and then fix that stuff for five minutes. After that, I, I, I took the uh, pump back. We can start working on that. Otherwise, uh, over 100 gallon of the chemical overnight, it's not good. We need the sample as uh, uh, as accurate as possible. So we might need to dump all the solution and make it again. We might need to buy a new pump. 
So uh, it's really the because Eric school and Eric great job. So we always have the peace of mind. We now we can fix everything and to serve the general capture teaching lab. We will always remember Eric is huge loss for the department and for the family. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I'm Jay Zwire, and I'm uh, from the EPR Center in the, over in the Davis Heart and Lung Research Institute. And uh, you know, we're so sad uh, with the untimely loss of, of Eric, such a special person. And uh, I have to say, you know, through our, our years, and I guess it was about seven years that he was associated uh, working in our group at the EPR Center, and. Uh, at the Davis Heart and Lung Research Institute and the Medical Center, and just such a special, caring person, and uh, someone who's a real inspiration, I think, to all of us, ranging from the physicians to the scientists to the other engineers in the group. And uh, in thinking back, I, I kind of think back to when I first met Eric. Uh, we had moved, uh, my group actually from Johns Hopkins in 2002 uh, to Ohio State, and it was sort of a a new uh, experience for all of us who came from Hopkins. There was about maybe 21 of us or so at the time that had moved. And, uh, but we lost our very talented engineer who uh, was one of uh, two or three folks that stayed in Baltimore. And this was a big loss to us uh, being a technical group that does magnetic resonance and all types of biomedical science. And we thought to ourselves, you know, would we somewhere in Columbus, Ohio, out in the uh, Midwest, uh, some people considered it from East, I guess a bit of a cow town, but it really isn't anymore. You know, it's a center capital for the state and the university here and all the wonderful things. But we wondered, will we find someone who had all of these wonderful talents? And uh, when we came, it was interesting. We first uh, had an engineer named Scott Yano. I don't know if anyone knew Scott, but uh, he uh, actually eventually transitioned to Lakeshore. And, uh, but at that time, we were looking for a, a second engineer, a design engineer. And uh, Eric uh, had applied uh, to Scott for that position. And then Scott came to me one day and said, you know, Jay, this, 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 this man, young man, you got to really meet. He's, he's incredible. He, you know, he, he can do all kinds of things. And at that point, I had already interviewed 10 people. And I was thinking, oh, gee, I don't know if we're going to find someone like the engineer we had back in uh, in, in Baltimore, and uh, but then I, I, I uh, met Eric, and he, he made a, a tremendous impression. Again, this is back in, in 2003. He came in, and unlike anyone else, he came in with his um, attaché of projects that he could show me these wonderful things that wherever he had went, he built something very unique and incredible with great creativity. And our position was as a, a design engineer. So in addition to fixing things, the person needed to know how to design new concepts and new types of circuits uh, up into the radio frequency and microwave range. And he showed me all of these projects. And I said, Eric, you, you did all this yourself. I mean, you we're, were in a company. The way most companies work today, you have you know one engineer does this piece, and another engineer does that piece, and very few can do, do the whole thing. He said, no, no, uh, Jay, you know, I, I, you know, Dr. Zor, I, know I, I built this whole thing. And, I kept a prototype example uh, just because you know it was so special, and uh, so when I saw that, I said, "Well, Eric, you know, you're you're the man for this job. I think you'll you'll like it here." And uh, talked to him about the different projects we had, and um, and indeed, uh, you know, I think he really enjoyed the time in the lab. There were many different projects, many different things he built. In addition, a, a bonus for him was that beyond building new designs, which was our main uh, goal. In, in, in our magnetic resonance type grants. Uh, he also could fix most anything, as was said. He, he had a real flair for this, a God-given gift that he could look at something and you know, very shortly see what was wrong with it. And it's something that very few people have. It's, it's um, you know, a, a unique, uh, unique gift. And 
you know, for us, it was just a real pleasure to have him with us all the time. And as you look in the picture here, you see Eric smiling, but in truth, his smile was in person even more so. He'd come in and he'd light up the room. And, you know, other than occasionally startling him, as was mentioned, uh, uh, our place wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a little easier, but still we would startle him from time to time. He would, I think he'd be deep in thought on a project, which is why that would happen. Um, but, uh, you know, he would just, just light up the room with his enthusiasm, uh, always kind and loving to those around him. I never saw him frown. I never saw him angry at people, and, and believe me, there were some things and things that could make you really, really angry. Uh, I think back to the engineering area where we worked. Uh, we, we were fortunate to have um, almost always two engineers, and, and Eric was the, the engineer who was very good in both uh, design of electronic circuits, uh, fixing things, and also mechanical design. Uh, the other engineer we had was a, a very interesting gentleman who was incredibly creative. He was like a tornado of activity. And I, I like to think that, that Eric would find uh, and have a place for everything. You'd have you know, thousands of parts and electronics. Uh, the other engineer was a tornado of activity. So when he finished, things were everywhere. And then Eric was the one who would put them back uh, where they needed to be. And if ever you had two opposites, these were two opposites. But Eric was kind and could really work with anyone. And uh, so it was interesting to see that these two opposites could exist and that, that Eric and his kindness had consideration uh, for his colleague and, and really everyone in the group through good times and, and hard times as happened with the uh, grant funded labs. He was always there for everyone. And um, again, I, I think of him as an inspiration to us as a person who always was kind to others and was always trying to fix things. Uh, there's a, a word for that. He, he was a tinkerer and that he liked to build things, but he was also a word called tikkuner. A tikkuner is a person who fixes things and has a, a God-given gift to do that. And he was a person who had these unique capabilities and, and, and we miss him very much. I'm glad to hear all the wonderful things he did in chemistry. I only knew a bit of that and we would see him from time to time and occasionally he'd still fix our instrumentation. But again, we, we miss him very much. It's, it's such a shock an untimely passing, but we'll, we'll always think of him as we think about you know, all the projects that he worked on and all, all the good that he did for, for all those uh, around him. And my condolences uh, to Brenda and to you know, the family. It's really a tremendous loss to us, and I know how much more of a, a loss it is to you. So we'll, we'll you know, miss him very much. Hello, I'm Bob Tatz. I spent three decades uh, as an undergraduate uh, teaching supervisor uh, for all the nurse grad labs. And so I had a great experience with the people that gave us the support in CSIG and also in the machine shop. And um, I just, you know, when, when I remember the first day when I came in, and I expected to see Dale as I sailed into the office and just kind of all of a sudden, Eric, oh, I'm going, oh, yeah, you're, you're the guy that, kind of, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, boy, Dale was amazing. And, and Eric replaced him just, and all these things you, you know, you heard Tanya talk about Dale. We were just really panicky because Dale was, you know, he was the boss, actually. I think then when I went to the machine shop, it, I wouldn't find the boss. I would find a bunch of these guys working on projects. And, and Eric, I actually once I did say, Eric, you know, if you put a little photo cell here and like a doorbell thing, when they walk in there, you wouldn't be so surprised. <laughs> so, um, but we, are, we have been blessed by amazing people. The last time, Jerry Hoff was a longtime member of the department. Okay, he, did, he just in the machine shop. But I didn't come here, even though my life depended on it often in the labs. Do I need this part from the machine shop? Do I need this thing from the, the electronics shop? I would go in, I remember one time I had to fix a, um, my own laptop. I had taken it apart and it was a power problem. So he used his military spec, you know, soldering. <laughs> 
And he'd just do stuff, you know, just walk in and he would just, you know. But from that very first time when I met him in that situation, he was just a great guy, just so friendly. And, and so I can speak, Lou has been here for a long time, you know, uh, talked about how essential, you know, the, the, the things that we rely on to do and get every day done in the lab, special projects, special gadgets, special things, no problem. And, and all of these different support groups work together, except for Tim Henthorne, he's kind of a loner. But. <laughs> But he's the only guy in the glass shop, so that's why. But I didn't come here because Eric was an amazing, uh, amazing worker. I didn't come here because of that. I came here because he consoled me three years ago when I lost my spouse. I came here because the people that like Jerry, ah, I've been here a long time, they are my friends. They are my best friends. And it's a terrible loss. And I'm very sorry. And I will pray for all of you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Jim Brook. I worked in the electronic shop and for 34 years and was preparing to retire when, uh, when we interviewed Eric. And uh, Eric had a very impressive resume. We all, everybody in the shop met and talked to him. He was very personable and uh, he brought along a small circuit board that he'd made to, uh, I believe he said it was to sweep the field on an EPR for uh, calibration. And just looking at the board, the board was very nicely done, it was well designed, and it was very well fabricated. And I figured he had the technical end of it down pretty well, as well as his resume, which was also very impressive. And the one thing that I wondered about was, well, how are his people skills? And the more that we talked, the more I became convinced that he had that pretty well covered also. And there are many people who have that combination of skills, but as we talked, we eventually got to the part of talking where I asked him, well, what do you like to do in your spare time? And he told me, well, I have a Ford Mustang that I've been restoring. And to be truthful about it, that raised my eyebrows more than anything else he had said. It meant that he had the passion and desire to do things. And it certainly appeared by that point that he also had what I call the, the tinkerer's bug. And pretty much most people who work in shops like that have this to varying degrees. They're, the shops are just full of people that always take things apart with their hands and put them back together, create new things, and keep old things going. And I was pretty sure he had that pretty well established too. Then by the time of about a month after Eric came, and started working in there, John Sullivan had mentioned the boxes that he carried in. Well, he had quite a number of boxes back there in her, his area, and just by looking at that, I can tell you, yeah, this guy's got that bug pretty bad too. <laughs> so, uh, but really, Eric was a great guy. He was always personable. And uh, like Eric, I also pedaled back and forth to work. I'd see him on the bike path from time. I pedaled much slower than Eric. Eric would always zip by me. And in fact, one day I went into work and called him a speed racer. But uh, he was a great guy, and, and I thought of him as my friend. I just, you know, I retired about three months after he arrived there. And uh, really the thing about chemistry and many other places is the work that you do there is important or, or we wouldn't do it, but Having been retired for quite a number of years, uh, I don't miss the work so much, but what I do miss is the pe all the people who I worked with, Eric included. 
because the friendships you build there are they're just so special. It's not something you can do in many places, but but it is exceptional that you can do that in the chemistry department. And Eric was a great guy. I know I'll miss him. I just wish I'd known him better than I do. Thank you. Brenda and to everyone here, I think we've um, um, confirmed um, many of the things that we knew individually, that uh, Eric was a phenomenal engineer, and the uh, um, wizards of the electronic shop had a super wizard who ran that shop, and we are just so incredibly grateful to have had him um, in our department for a long time and he will be missed in incredible ways. However, as Jay pointed out, um, Eric was a fixer. And I think Eric would like us to work on fixing ourselves and soon, because as you see that big smile, um, Eric would want us to find um, ways to support each other and to make sure that, that uh, we find a path but I also want, to, one of the things when I was sitting in the hospital waiting to see Eric, and I want you to know that as, as the chair, the things that I was thinking about was that the members of the staff don't get told enough how very, very thankful we are for their support and their incredible, um, their incredible work. I have to tell you that there's been many a day when I've walked into the electronic shop and I wanted to ask Eric something or, or another member of the shop. And I walk in and I see this incredible dispersion of, of activity that's happening in the electronic shop. Often it's just piles of, of things that the, that the shop members are working on for the, the Gen Chem or organic. And I'm thinking, why did I even come in here? You are so busy, I shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> but, they do just spectacular work, and I am so very appreciative of the incredible staff that we have, and just so appreciative of Eric's contribution to that and his leadership. We will miss him horribly, and I thank you all for coming. Um, I think there will be um, some um, brief snacks outside, and, and uh, let's, let's talk, and um, let's try to find ways to come together and, and support each other. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>